Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show on which we explore the story of you through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner, producer of the show. Thrilled to have you here. We've got a great guest. This guest and this interview are really, really special today. Before I get to that, I want to remind you that Ian has his brand new book, The Story of You, available now everywhere fine books are sold. Also, there is an audio version available, and it is with Ian himself reading it. So I always love it when you get to hear the author read their works, and so I'm glad Ian got to read his. Listen, today we've got a great guest, Enneagram 5, Brant Hansen. He's an author, radio host, advocate for healing children with correctable disabilities through Cure International, and it's close to his heart because Brant himself was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, and he's overcome a lot in his life. He's the author of a brand new book called The Men We Need, and Ian and Brant will get into that. He's written for CNN.com, The Washington Post, U.S. News and World Report, Relevant Magazine, and numerous other outlets. He hosts his own podcast called The Brant and Sherry Oddcast. We're happy to have Brant here. I personally was so moved and impacted by the way Brant opened up in today's show. I know you're going to love it. I'm glad you're here. That's it for me, Anthony Skinner. Love to you all. And now, without any further ado, here's the host of our show, Ian Cron. Brant Hansen, Enneagram 5. Welcome to Typology. Thank you. It's an honor. Hmm. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> uh, no, I listened, I've listened to the show for a while and my wife loves it. And so it really is an honor. It's like, oh, wow, this is cool. I'm on it. Thank you so mm-hmm. much. And uh, I, I'm joking, but you know, lots of people have said that at the beginning and left with an entirely different impression. <laughs> um, you've got this, uh, this wonderful, wonderful new book out. And I want you to tell people all about it. Sure. It's called The Men We Need. And it's about distinct masculinity that is modeled after being a keeper of the garden. Mm. And that means being makers of spaces where the vulnerable can thrive. Mm. And I feel like that's, that was Adam's job to protect that space and create that space. I feel like a lot of guys don't have that vision for themselves. So I wanted to lay that out. And I think a lot of the deconstruction of masculine ideas has been pretty healthy. Like a lot of it, there's a lot of toxic stuff that we do need to get rid of, but I'm left going, okay, well, what's the, what's the good thing we can look at? What's something beautiful that's beneath all of that? Um, that's a vision we can actually give people something because we need a construct too, not just a deconstruct. So that's what I'm trying to do. And I, I don't get into gender theory and stuff like that much. I really wanted it to be more just of a practical wisdom book, mm. especially for guys to go, this is what masculinity looks like when it's at its absolute best. And that's the, the cultivator and the protector. And the, uh, the man who creates that space and is, people can flourish because he's around. Hmm. That's both sides. Beautiful. Thank you. So you're an Enneagram five. Yeah. And I want to know, because I, I have a special affection for Enneagram fives. Um, two of my best friends are Enneagram fives. I have a circle about five close friends. Two of them are fives who I have a, just a deep and profound love for. Um, and by the way, you also have, have Asperger's, which is an interesting conversation about fives and Asperger's, right? Um, that yes. we can have at some point. Yeah. Uh, people have asked me and I'm not sure what the answer is. I mean, I actually thought you might have it, um, where the five starts and begins and where the Asperger's starts and begins too, because there's so much overlap. Um, but that's, that's squarely where I am. And, uh, my son is the same way. We're both clearly fives but that's he's on the spectrum as well and what's your wife's type she's a one and she's the one that got me into the enneagram and i was very skeptical about Mm. it i just don't i i'm skeptical about all the typology systems i just you know you don't want to be categorized you don't be put in a box all that you've heard all this before but the fact that she found so much validity in her type as a one which she would say my her biggest problem is criticism accepting it taking it to heart because she's got this internal critical dialogue already going on where she's already castigating herself all the time and so it's difficult for me to speak into that but the winning thing to me was the way that she took it so seriously and took it to heart and the way the way the enneagram critiqued her and she said i need to change in this way i've realized this is who i am 
in all the ways that drive her crazy, just, just nailed that and her humility and being willing to go, okay, I'm going to change. And I didn't have to say anything. I mean, this wasn't me foisting, Hey, you know, picking at her personality or too much of this, that, but that's really winning. If your spouse takes that sort of thing on and humbles herself and becomes a more pleasant person to live with, like to me, that was a, quite a endorsement. And the fact that she could see me on this and that, that allowed me to read it. And I had to say, yeah, this, that's entirely me to the point that, and you make this point in your book, it's, it's stuff that bothers you about yourself. Mm -hmm. And there's things I have a hard time, honestly, in your podcast, the personalities I enjoy the most are everybody but five. Mm. It's hard for me to listen to the five. Why is that? Do you think? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I guess cause it just hits home too much or something. Hmm. Well, you know, I think we had a, we had a research psychologist on his name was Richard Beck and Richard's a, a marvelous psychologist and, and a deep, deep thinker. And he had the same experience when he heard about the Enneagram. He was like, he rolled his eyes uh -huh. and he's like, there is no scientific evidence that will support this, this system. And then his, his wife got deeply into it, deeply into it. Uh, and he began to see profound emotional, psychological, and spiritual changes in her. Uh -huh. And then he began to read it and, and was convinced of its validity. And, uh, but what he said was what, that, you know, well, you know, anecdotal evidence is evidence. Yes. Right? Right. And so, you know, he, he just ran with the idea that I don't need to see charts and graphs. I, I, I'm living with, you know, the, the evidence itself that the system works. Yeah, obviously. And I'm, I'm a believer in God and I take people's stories at face value as a story. Like if, if somebody's had an experience that has changed them, I don't say, okay, let me subject this to some peer reviewed whatever. It's like, no, I just listen to the person. Hmm. And sometimes it's very helpful. So yeah, that's, that's exactly what happened to us. And I didn't want to accept it, but on the other hand, it, it, it opened up something which I hadn't even thought about, about my desire to conserve energy at every level, which, you know, again, you, you talk about in the, in the book that that's a huge issue for us as fives. But I heretofore hadn't even thought about that. That's what I was doing. I didn't, I didn't have a name for it, but sure enough, that's exactly what I do on a daily basis. And I'm constantly afraid, honestly, that people are going to come and just drain me and no, I'll have, I'll just be left on the street, lying limp, just socially <laughs> exhausted, unable to function. Right. Right. We're grateful that you said you saved all your energy for this interview. Today, I totally though, right? did. I haven't talked all day. I'm like, I'm going to have an interview coming up. I'm going to have some personality. It's going to yeah. be great. Yeah. Oh man, I, I hear you. And we do appreciate your, your saving your, your relational energy for, for our time together. What was it about the five that most, if I can use this word, maybe too strong, repelled you. When you read it, you're like, I just, I just don't want to see this dimension of who I am. I hate the hoarding of information, but it's all I do. Hmm. I'm scared to not have it. I'm scared to show up and not know everything. So I'm probably typical in a sense, like in high school, I was... <laughs> Well, this is not typical. What am I saying? I was the president of the Illinois Student Librarians Association. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is common. Everybody's doing that. <laughs> That's not common. You can't make this up, man. <laughs> yeah, but think about that. Like, literally, like, so I just want to know things. So I was on, like, the quiz bowl, and I dominated. Like, my brother was an athlete and was popular with girls and stuff. I just absolutely dominated trivia. It was my area to know things. And it was embarrassing if I didn't know everything. I've memorized tables of baseball t statistics, like, uh, like all of that advanced analytics and stuff. That was my thing. I didn't have much of a social life. That's all I did was pour over these stats and try to come up with algorithms for better player evaluation and whatnot. But I wanted to never not know who led the league, you know, an on-base percentage in 1983 or whatever. I don't like that about me now. I don't, I don't want to be a know-it-all. I joke about it. I'm a, I'm a radio host, so on the air, I do joke about the fact that I'm one of those actually guys. 
you know, who's like, well, actually, it ruins a good joke. Or ruin, like, nobody likes that guy. Um, but I don't want to, I want to be free to forget. Because um, nobody's judging me that way. Like, in, in my mind, they are. There's like this audience of people that are going to find me wanting if I don't have something insightful to say about Russian history. But that's not reality. This is, that's a lot of energies going there that I don't think is necessary. And I, I, don't, I want to change. I want to get, as I get older, I want to be a more graceful man who can listen and isn't so concerned about hoarding information. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Have you ever found yourself hoarding love and affection from uh, those who most want to support you in life? Yes, is the answer. And to elaborate, to give you a more interesting answer, I was just reading yesterday one of those studies you've seen them about where they ask old people, like, what do you regret the most? And the only one that really resonated with me, but it hit me hard for a, somebody who's not particularly emotional was the one about, I wish I would have expressed, I wish I would have, would have expressed my feelings more. And, you know, these are people at the end of their lives. And I know that's a problem for me. It has been, and I've get, I'm getting better. But that, that's actually been a function of the Enneagram too, to help me realize, and you, I'm not just, I'm, I'm, I just have read your book. So I'm, I'm, this is an organic mention of the fact that I just had read your book, but you mentioned that in the chapter about five, like rewriting your story is that you can do this. I, I don't know why I'm so scared or something and haven't been able to say to people who love me. It's very hard for me to say, even to my wife, 32 years of a great marriage, I love you, does not come naturally. Why? I don't like that because I do love her. She knows it, but I've gotten better lately, last few years. Um, I've been telling my mom I love her, and I, I've always withheld that. I'm not even sure why. I did hear you, and, and cut me off if I'm soliloquizing here, but I did hear you talking about Tim Mackey. And I, I missed that episode with the guy from the Bible Project, who I really like, I haven't mm -hmm. met him. About him watching Inside Out with his daughter or something, the movie, and just bursting into sobs. And I understand that. I'm wondering if... I, I, in my mind, I see myself as not being very emotional, but I'm wondering if like, I'm almost afraid that if I cross that, that, that veil, it's just going to be a flood. Like I'm going to just, it's all going to come out at once or something. I think fives, many fives feel that, um, if they open, uh, the door, to powerful feelings that they that they or that they might be surprised at the intensity of the experience. There, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that did, let me ask you this about your childhood. Did you grow up? Typically, fives have one of two. I don't want to be too reductive here, but let's say one of two experiences. One would be what what in psychology we call overwhelmment. It's this um, if you have a parent or a sibling or a culture in which you just feel emotionally overwhelmed by the other uh, or um, sometimes we call that engulfment it's it's almost as though you feel psychologically intruded upon and so you just kind of run up into the mind where it's safer right were either of those describe your experience or i'm gonna go with c which is both a and b <laughs> <laughs> e all of the above did you yeah. have very emotional? Did you have a very emotional parent, or emotionally a parent who wanted to get too much into your business? Not into my business. Um, I had a frightening upbringing. Now, my dad was a pastor, and very fundamental, uh, small town pastor. And we moved around a lot because of different traumatic things that would happen. Now they wound up getting divorced when I was maybe sixth or seventh grade, and they got remarried to each other and then divorced again when I was maybe a freshman in high school. Um, and there was a lot of, I was very, I was very scared 
often. Mm. Teeth chattering, knee knocking, mm. literally knees knocking scared mm. at times. And so the way I would normally deal with it, I had an older brother who was, who was the best. We're, we're still best friends. Um, but the way I would normally deal with it is I would hide in the bathroom and lock the door and I would sit on the floor. These are in tiny houses too. I mean, you can't get away from anything. We didn't have much money. But I would just start thinking of stories. I had like a puppet I would play with and I would think of stories. Um, but I did this all the time and I was just utterly frightened. This is one reason too I'm writing this book about masculinity. Because I'm like, I, I decided then like, I know what I'm going to do as a dad and my kids are going to come home or I'm going to come home and they're going to go, daddy, we're going to, are going to be happy on there. Mm. But, um, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of being scared and overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed and absolutely retreating into the life of the mind without question. And I have an operating theory too, about humor. I think like I use self deprecate, self deprecatory humor. A lot, but I also have a very absurd sense of humor. I'm a huge Monty Python fan. <laughs> Every it, five I know <laughs> <laughs> loves British comedy, man. They can't get enough of British comedy. They can't get enough. It's the, like that's, that's true. Uh, Black Adder. The oh British, my gosh. The British Office. You're speaking uh, my love language, okay, by the good. way. All this right. is Father Ted. I watched them all. all. Of it. Okay, oh, yeah. good. Yeah, and I'm a Chesterton guy too. Like yeah. I really love all of that. But I had heard. I don't know who said it originally. But if you grow up with pain, you're probably going to be a Monty Python fan. I do think that goes into your development of your sense of humor. The, I have to deal with it with absurdity. Mm -hmm. So everything becomes an absurd joke to me. Mm -hmm. And fives are brilliant at it. Like, like because fives have an unparalleled power of observation, right? They're constantly scanning the horizon. And because mm -hmm. fives typically observe life from a distance rather than participate in it. That is correct. Right? So what happens is you're constantly like watching and analyzing and watching, aggregating information, yes. watching, analyzing. And that means that you're observing the politics of the room, who's talking, who's doing what. And at just the right moment when there's a pause in the conversation, the five inserts the one sentence that brings the room to its <laughs> knees. Right? Right. It's, it's just like, right. right? It, everyone just right. starts laughing hilarious because nobody else observed it. It was, it was something that only the right. five could kind of see and, and register and, and then broadcast in very pithy terms. That's so true. And the irony is I'm a radio host, but I never wanted to be, I want to be the sidekick. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to be the guy. I always wanted to be the other guy who could observe what's going on and have something to say. Mm -hmm. Not just the guy that's going, blah, 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 blah. Like, I want to be the guy that says something about the guy. And it, I feel like my only, my best, my best comedic space is mocking things. And I know that's not necessarily a healthy thing, but it's true. Like, that's just, but, but how else are you going to deal with stuff? I don't know how, how in the world, it, it, anybody like looking back, how is that boy going to be as an adult if he's going to be healthy? Like that to me, this is probably the best case scenario and I still have puppets and I'm pretty good with them. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, man. man, no kidding. Yeah. That no kidding. Mr. Rogers, like, uh, I get him. Mm -hmm. Did you read a lot of fantasy and uh, science fiction stuff like, like CS Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and, Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, we just, I, my boy and I had just went to Oxford and went to the Eagle and the Child just to be in their, in their presence, so to speak. Went to their Inklings pub. Like we're huge fans. And yeah, that's, that's probably, a, that's obviously a sweet spot for fives. Too. Oh my gosh. Yes. And when I meet a, I oftentimes, when I have a little kid come, you know, I meet a little kid and we, the parents, I think he's a five. I go, does he read J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis? Does he does he does he like gaming? Does he like uh, going into the woodshed and dragging five books with him and like hiding from the rest of the family that's draining and deleting everything in him? That is absolutely you know? right. So you've written this book uh, about healthy masculinity, of, of recapturing, uh, reimagining masculinity in a cultural social context, in which there's a great deal of confusion about what does it mean. Yes. To, to be a man. It's interesting. Actually, our mutual friend, Mike Cusick, and I just, uh, he invited me to be a therapist on a 
weekend for addicts. Huh. Uh-huh. And uh, one of the <clears throat> most amazing moments in it was uh, we had a, a person who shared that what they were trying to find was their the reason they were there and the reason for their addiction was because they they needed they wanted to find their own masculine self. Huh. Uh, and it was a very beautiful multi-day journey of of, of uncovering that with that person uh-huh. um but all to say i think that person's emblematic of a greater cultural uh confusion if you will about what it means to be a man and what's fascinating about this book is that <clears throat> this isn't a book that's about information this is a very heart book so how to, so we're talking here about oh i have so much trouble with emotions i have so much trouble you as a five but yet you've written a very heartfelt book. Um, I think, and you're right, and I had to keep fighting off the, the, the academic direction with this because I kept thinking, no, Brant, just be a blessing to people because th- there are people that can write a better academic treatise, and there are. All, there's books all over the place about different you know, constructions and deconstructions of masculinity and gender and whatnot. Like, no, I want to be a blessing. So that's what I have to do every day because my radio show, I'm, I'm literally asking God, please give me what I need, my resources that I need for today to be a blessing to people. Please, because I don't feel like I have them. But then I remember Jesus saying, here's how you pray. Uh, pray for your daily bread. And as a five, that prayer is, Lord, give me the energy that I need to make it through today, please. Mm-hmm. To be a blessing to people. Let me say things that would be a blessing. So I'm constantly in that posture of, I don't have what it takes today. God, please give it to me. And I, I kind of took that with this book to just say, just, just be a blessing. Don't, don't go down the argument road. And I know pe- some people are going to be like, you make any distinctions about anything in this realm, you can, you can be down a million academic rabbit trails, and that's, that's fine. But I really was just thinking, guys need a vision for how to live. They don't have it. And this is a beautiful one. And I think women recognize that this is a good one. I saw this poster when I was in college. I don't know if you remember this. It's the most, this is the most famous poster in the history of posters. And it's a guy holding a baby. It's a, it's called L'Enfant. It was, it was taken by a guy in Paris. And the, the dude holding the baby is like, he's got his shirt off. He's wearing jeans. And of course he's a good looking guy. It's from a profile. But I'm like, why did why is this so popular? And when I was in college at the University of Illinois, and it was like every girl's room had the same poster. Like, what is so attractive about this guy? And what the what a couple girls told me, and I've since read about the poster, and it's this kind of the consensus, it's not the guy. I mean, he's he's a hot guy, but there's lots of male models out there. It's the way the baby's looking at him. Hmm. Hmm. And that was really interesting to me. Like so. This vulnerable thing is looking at him like you're gonna you're gonna guard over me, right? And you can see that in the look. And I just I just thought even then there's women intuit when we're at our best. And that is again taking care of the vulnerable and the and and the weak around us, and it's our job to protect them. So if you could you could even tell a seven year old boy, like I did with my son. I don't what what are you doing? You're hurting your sister. You're picking on her. You're betraying your role, man. You're here to protect her. That's your job, to protect her and make sure that she thrives and flourishes. Like this is this is who you're supposed to be. And a seven year old boy can understand that. Like that is my job. This is why I don't pick on animals because I'm supposed to protect the animals. I'm not supposed to be cruel. Like, but unfortunately, I don't think guys are told this very much. Mm-hmm. Like this is your role. But once you do, you realize what you can do with your words. You can either betray that role. Mm. You can you can make your wife feel insecure, your family feel insecure, or you can use your words to make them feel secure around you. Mm. And once guys get a picture of that, I think it's beautiful because you don't have to be, I don't hunt, I don't fish. I told you I have puppets. I play the flute. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so if, if I can embody that, and when I do embody that, my wife is extremely attracted to me. Mm. Conversely, when, I'm, when I don't, when she has reasons to feel insecure around me, it's not an attractive thing. I just think there's something they intuit about us that's really good. So if there's a five angle to this book, I think it's maybe the, what's it, I wanna know what's at the bottom of everything. I wanna know what's really motivating people, what's really going on. 
I know muscles and trucks and motorcycles are awesome. I don't, that's not my thing, but what's really going on? What is it that, what is really a beautiful picture of masculinity? And I do think that that job that was given Adam in that narrative is, is it. Hmm. All right. Let's unpack that a little bit. What, what was the task that Adam was given or the tasks that Adam was given that you believe all these many millennia later um, are at the core of the masculine that we need to reclaim or we need to um, take responsibility for in, in our own lives? Well, I think it is that job that was specifically given to him. And it's the, it, he, made, he was made keeper of the garden. And exploring that, and exploring that, it's really a matter of not just protecting the garden, um, like physically standing guard, although that's part of it, but again, also keeping it up. So if somebody's a gardener, you're creating space for a species that can't necessarily win the survival of the fittest in the wilderness. I mean, that's if, if, if you just hand it over to chaos and wilderness and survival of the fittest, well, Certain species are going to win. Other ones will never see the light of day. They'll be extinct. But there are these little beautiful blooms. There's these little beautiful things. There's these precious, precious species that can survive because of your attention to them and your, your, the way you water them and weed them and take care of them. But it's your, your space. And this is why I think it's true that when they both blew it, when, when Adam did not protect Eve from the serpent, the, the serpent figure in that story, um, he's there. He's with her. He's not far away. Like in the text, you look at the actual words. He's not off in a hammock somewhere. He's right there with her and he doesn't say anything or do anything. Well, when they both blow it, God's reaction is he comes into the garden and he says, Adam, where are you? Like he's holding Adam responsible for keeping the garden and protecting it. They're both cursed, by the way, both Adam and Eve. She's given a different, incredibly significant role, which is sometimes translated helpmate or helper, but that doesn't catch it. Elsewhere in the Bible, it's rescue where God is used as, that same word is used for God when he comes to rescue with his armies. Like he, that's what she is. But his role is this keeper of the garden. And I just happen to think that that's the role that women even now into it that we we're supposed to inhabit. So yeah, that's, that's me unpacking that. I'm not a Hebrew scholar and I'm just kind of taking a shot at it. I think it's true, but I'm no scholar. And, um, I, I think we need some construction and that's a pretty good one. Mm. You're going to take a lot of heat for this book. I know. <laughs> that's what my friends told me. <laughs> Fortunately, I have another book about not being offended. <laughs> so, you can always reference that when you need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll well, you, you can, for all the obvious reasons, right? Um, so someone might say this is a very reactionary sort of um, posture of to course. take toward thinking about men and women, about the masculine and the feminine, um, that it's uh, patriarchal, that it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, offensive on lots of levels. I mean, how are you going to answer the, those people who would say, you know, this is a sexist. You don't want to get more of though. What's that? The opposite. Really? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm doing, I'm not doing the manly man book. It's really not patriarchal. It's really not. I think a woman who, who reads it from the perspective of somebody who's like, I'm looking for this. Like, what is he saying? Really? What's he really getting at? would be like, actually, I do want men to behave this way. Like be my biggest fan, support me. That's what I'm saying as a husband and father. The, the problem I'm going to have is going to be with guys that are like, this doesn't look like, you didn't mention elk hunting. Like you didn't, where's the man? We need men to take a stand and stand I mean the up. wild at heart sort of view of. I've had a friend say, this should be called mild at heart. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what? If someone reads the book and they've got a critique, that's fine. Yeah. You know, but like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to give men a vision for what masculinity really is. Cause I think there really is a thing called masculinity and femininity. And they're, they're actually, these are things, these are, they're both parts of God's image. There's something beautiful about both. So if we're just going to deconstruct to the point, we can't even say that there is such a thing. Well, then I don't, you know, I, I just humbly disagree. And I think that this actually is a pretty beautiful idea that we would, our, our culture would be way better off 
if men were like this. It's not about owning women. It's not about treating people as property. It's not about flexing. It's not about threatening. It's the exact opposite. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Let's Rare. see what happens. You know, like I think it was Flannery <laughs> O'Connor who said something to, this is a bastardization of the quote, but she says something to the effect of, you know, when I write a book and I put it out in the world, it's no longer my business. Ha! Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to find the exact quote and send it to you. But it, it, it essentially is, you know, now that it's out of my hands. There it is. You know, there it is. Do with it as you please. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, I want it to be a blessing. So if it is and families are better off down the line or women and children are treated better, but I get ripped, I have to, I have to say that's a good deal. Mm. I have to. I think it is. You know, I'm just a big believer, uh, as long as it's not damaging to somebody, a piece of work that, um, you know, everything that is in addition to the conversation. Um, your book, I'm sure, as, as you w would probably say, is not the end of the conversation. Um, it's just another voice uh, lending, that's, that's lending where itself I to I disagree it. because it is the end of the conversation. This is the final. <laughs> This is it. This is it. No yeah. other book need There's, be written. Uh, so, you know, that's where we agree to disagree. This is the final. <laughs> well, that's good self-promotion right there, brother. <laughs> you just sold 500 extra books on that one. Keep, <laughs> keep that up and you're going to be like at the top word. of the New York Times bestseller list right now. I can tell word. you that. So <clears throat> I think that men are cast in the role of um, the angry sex. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and in some ways it's because in, in some ways, perhaps it's because it's culturally unacceptable for women to openly express anger without being labeled a bitch, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think that there's this sort of archetype of the male being controlling and angry or potentially explosive and violent, you, you know, on and on and on. And yet you're painting a very different picture. The opposite. OK, I'm telling guys that anger is not masculine mm -hmm. because of what I'm saying about the definition of it. Yours, you, you are someone who brings security, not insecurity. If you're an angry man in your home, you're not making your wife more secure. You're not making your kids more secure. You're doing the opposite. You're actually undermining their security. But if you're a man who's willing to take action to do what needs to be done, uh, cool headed, you're actually operating out of a, a an understanding that, Humans are messed up. That's the world. But I'm gonna I'm gonna be a person who's a person of forgiveness. But I will take action to defend the vulnerable and the innocent. It's my my opinion. Uh, you are fulfilling that role. And it's interesting because my wife, we had some kids the other night. And again, I'm not a fighter guy at all, at all. Um, but we had some high school guys out front of our house the other night. And they were just raising a huge ruckus. It was it was pretty loud and they were wrestling and fighting and there were people, I don't know what was going on, but it really didn't bother me. It's like 11 o'clock. We're in bed and I'm like, well, let them, you know, these teenagers are going to be teenagers. And my wife was really stressed about it. She kept getting up and looking out the blinds, seeing what's going on. And somebody needs to do something. Maybe I should call the police. And I'm like, it's just, don't worry about it. It's just kids doing stuff. Well, they kept going and she went downstairs and she's like, I got to do stuff. So I'm lying in bed. Now she's, thinking, what should we do about this downstairs? And I, it's like, okay, Brant, get up. Don't make your wife deal with this. So I put on some clothes real quick and I went to the front door and, and she was standing there like looking out and I opened the door and I walked out there and, um, they dissipated. I don't think they dissipated before they saw me, but they were gone. I didn't know what was going to happen. I'm like, I guess, I don't know if we're going to have like a West side story rumble here. Or what's going to happen? <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. But when I came back, my wife was like really attracted to me <laughs> and I didn't even do anything. And I told her I didn't do anything. She's like, yeah, but that was cool. I mean, you went out there cause you didn't want me to have to deal with it. You can hire some guys to do that every couple of weeks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like she's a brilliant woman. My wife is a brilliant uh, intellect and has an extremely strong, she's an extremely strong person whom I admire and respect, but she finds it very attractive. I'm actually willing to take action, actually do something. Mm -hmm. And so that I think she feels more secure because she knows I'm not going to be passive all the time. I'm, I, I am going to step up and do what it needs to be done for her 
and not just ignore a problem. And I think it's a, a real problem in a lot of relationships from what I can tell just anecdotally. Um, so again, it's not the anger thing. Um, it's, it's the anger makes you less of a good husband and, and, and less of a good keeper of the garden. It's the, it's the cool headed willingness to act that makes you a good keeper of the garden. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, you write in the book that there are six decisions, right? Yes. That will set men apart from, uh, from others. Yeah. Okay. Well, can you just briefly tell me what those six decisions are? Let's see. Um, let's see. Now, this is a good quiz for an author without his own book in front of him. They're all really good decisions. One was protecting the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. One was making women and children related to that feel secure. Like your neighborhood should be more secure because you're there, whether they know it or not. But they are because you're there. Um, one of them is forsaking the fake and relishing the real, which is obviously a huge issue for guys being willing to say it's, I'm trying to say to younger guys, throwing yourself into the virtual world, into the metaverse or just pornography and games. You could say, given the, the reigning ethos, hey, as long as I'm not hurting anybody else, what does it matter? And I'm trying to tell them because I'm this way too. Like this is, this could be my struggle as well. You are hurting other people because we needed you we needed the you that you were created to be, to be here. There's people that could have been blessed by that, protected by that. There's, there's people that would have benefited from you being maximally you, you growing up and developing and being engaged with the people around you. We really would have benefited, but now we won't. So I, I want people to understand that. Like this, it's not a, it's not a, as long as I'm doing no harm uh, construct. So. Um, that's one of them. I'm trying to think of the other. Oh, take responsibility for your own spiritual life. I'm trying to encourage guys because I'm this way too, being a five and being not particularly emotional. I don't resonate with worship music. I mean, I'm a musician, but I bring it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't have the reaction. But you see people. And I actually got up. I was a guest speaker at a. It was a mega church type thing, and they had a great band. You know, and the fog machines and lasers and and satellites or whatever's going on in there. Um, and I got up afterward and everybody, everybody had, had their hands up and it was, you know, emotional and stuff. And I said, how many of you, I'm just curious, um, during the worship music feel like maybe everybody else is having a different experience than you are. Like you don't quite get it. And half the people I swear, raised their hands like, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that are not having goosebump moments. It's fine if you do. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Those emotions are good, I'm sure. But there's a lot of us that equate, we were taught to equate spirituality with some sort of emotional state. And a lot of those are guys who feel like I'm missing something. Like maybe God has abandoned me because of my sin, the things I've done wrong, things I'm caught up in. And I'm trying to tell us, me, myself included, I don't see Jesus talking much about emotions. There's this thing called hesed, steadfast, loving kindness, this loyalty that he's big on, like that God's big on, this loyalty thing where we continue to obey and keep coming back to him even though we're sinners, we keep coming back every day, he still loves us. Loyalty I can get, I can do that. Like that's what God's actually looking for. So I'm trying to encourage guys on those lines um, to take responsibility and don't be so discouraged about it. Like just keep coming back. And I think I've got five out of the six. The sixth one's probably the most powerful one, but I can't remember what it is. It's the one that will sell the most books. It, it absolutely but let's, sell. let's leave it out it's for best now. best left unsaid. <laughs> yes. It's too good. In fact, it's too good for the podcast. That's right. right. It's the hidden gem. So yes, go buy the book the and gem. go get the book and, and it, it, your full circle will come around, right? Full circle. You know what's so interesting to me is that... Um, that uh, many fives I know are drawn to the mystics mm -hmm. and they're drawn to the contemplative life. Of course, that's very natural to a five, right? Yes. Uh, as long as they can get their head out of the way, they can become uh, richly, in, in a, how do I want to say this? Um, they, they are looking for a unitive experience with God. They're, they're looking for union 
Um, and of course, some fives get stuck, particularly young ones, in the rut of theology. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, and particularly, I meet so many in the Reformed tradition, but, but that aside, um, they, 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 they can get stuck in the rut uh, versus um, moving into the space of saying, you know, all these thoughts about God. Well, it's like Pascal, right? It's like all these thoughts, all these, you know, he wrote his greatest work and then burned it. It's like, you know, clearly had this five energy thing going on. It's like, no, it's about union. Right, of being swept up into the uh -huh. mystic union with God. Is that is that a little piece of who you are? It, that resonates with me. I've, I've gone down those directions too, and I, I, I get impatient with that now. I pick, I pick up a little bit of that with you too, because I, I, I have done that. I'm like, you're, I'm, you're missing it. Like he's actually, he, won't, he didn't create us to be theological automatons. That was not his, his goal. I'm going to create a universe, a place where I can nurse people who will beat each other about the head and neck with the <laughs> theses, you know, like he apparently wants to know us and he, he wants to partner with us. And so that's been something I've been growing in just the last few years, um, in enjoying, and I don't want to just get caught up in my head. I do want it to be a relationship with him. But that's one of the appealing things. I go back and read the Gospels just because Jesus is the only one who makes any sense to me. He really is. I, I don't... His understanding of the human nature, his, his willingness to accept the simple and to astonish and, or, 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 or confuse the proud, like, I love that. I really, really love it. Like, just right straight to the heart of the matter and... To me, if I was talking to another five, I'd really encourage him. Just, I'm not, I'm not in this for the Christian T-shirts. I'm not in it for bumper stickers or the music. Like I'm in it because of Jesus. To me, is really compelling. And as a five, the way that he gets to the bottom of things and outflanks everyone intellectually is very satisfying to me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, um, it's hard for fives uh, to allow others to know them, right? Or it can take far longer yeah right for like you can get to know me pretty quickly i'm a very emotional person um i'm empathic i have a rich love for uh, i'm very curious about other people their stories how they've made sense of their suffering um how they've made uh found redemption and loss um these are kinds of topics that i'm very very comfortable and attracted to so I'm not hard to get, I, I can be very vulnerable with people pretty quickly. Um, and uh, so I'm curious then, how do you let God know you as a five? How do you let God in behind the veil that typically fives have with trouble with when it comes to other people? Man, that's a great question. I don't know how, I can tell you what I'm doing now. Um, when I walk our dog, we have a golden retriever named Cozy. And when I walk her, I try to have an honest conversation with him. And that has not, I've never been good at that ever until the last couple of years, really since the pandemic. And I started getting into walking more and thought, okay, well, this is going to be the time I actually do this. It's embarrassing because I've been a believer for so long, but I haven't communicated with him like I should, like, like I, like I could have, that's what, how I should put it. So. I also heard something really helpful, which, which is with, if your mind drifts when you're trying to talk to God, find what your mind is drifting to and bring that back into the prayer because apparently it, it matters to you. So whatever that subject is, so it must matter. It'll matter to him too. Uh, and the other, the other thing that's helped me understand is the way that God chose Abraham as someone to partner with. I mentioned partnering with him before, like when I conceived of it that way, like, okay, well, prayer then is me and God talking about what we're going to do to get together today and that's helped me immensely so i don't know if that's a how-to as much as it's what i'm learning about now and i've been i'm getting some traction with it like i'm growing up i think i'm getting more patient and more loving with people and i am more joyful um, so i think those are good markers mm. Mm. does that make sense probably yeah. not a good answer but that's what i'm doing hmm so you talked about your your children earlier and the desire for them to have a different experience of life than than you had and i'm hearing 
as you speak, obviously, actually, I'm hearing capital T trauma, not little t trauma, probably both complex trauma and, you know, what I've called episodic, some, you know, moments of profound trauma. And I think in some ways our personalities are born from trauma, that they're actually re a reaction to trauma. And I yes. think the Enneagram supports that idea. Um, try and access your feeling space right now. And tell me from a, as much as you can from that well of, of feeling that you have access to. Imagine that, imagine your child were here. What would you tell them that you feel about them? See, you're trying to get this thing to happen right now on the podcast where I just explode in a bunch mm -hmm. of sobs. <laughs> no, but we're okay if you do. <laughs> Remember, I'm comfortable in that Let's space. Let's make him cry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm curious Ew, though. I, but, I, oh, gosh. I don't know that I can, and it, which is weird too, because I'm a words guy. So I'm a five who comes with words. I come bearing words. I do traffic in words, and I am a five. So I almost feel like an ambassador from the fives. Like, I, can I come representing all of us? Um, can I say something? Yeah. There's a, a five I was working with one time, and this really helped him. I said, don't think your way to your feelings, but imagine your way to your feelings. Oh, gosh. So if you could imagine <laughs> that scenario, what might you feel? I'm talking to my own kids. Good grief. I, 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 guys, I can't do it. Uh, mm. And I'm sorry. I, that's... And I, man. Ugh. Um, uh, see, it, that, uh, you know, like, I'm, I'm going to get all emotional and stuff. I don't want to. Um, it, well, I, I had this dream one time. Or it's kind of like a vision. I don't have visions very often, but just like it's image that popped into my head. I was first leaving to go to India, and I had never traveled like that. Since then, I've been all over, like, I don't know how many different countries. But the first time, the kids were six and three, and uh, I just had this image of us, like the four of us. And it, it was a very sweet image, just out, outdoors, like, coming down a hill and, and I thought I thought I don't want them to stay this age but this has been the biggest honor in my life mm. and they, they know this because I because I treasured them they know they were treasured all the way through and that they still are but it got better and better like I was worried that oh, if I could just bottle this moment right now, but I enjoyed every single stage. It got better and better, and it's still better. I, I mean, everything, every bit of their character is a joy to me, and I didn't expect that to happen. So they are friends. I respect them. I trust them. Uh, I just enjoy. There's just nothing right now. It's like it's weird. It's just been distilled down to joy. Before it's you know protection and concern and correction and but this it, that's all just been distilled. So that would be the the best picture. I still have that. I still have that image in my head of the four of us, and I don't want to go back to that, but I still like it. Like that happened. That really happened. Now. We're about to have our first grandchild um, in weeks. So I'm looking forward to that whole experience too. I'm sure that'll open up new new ways for me to try to hold my emotions in. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. We've had about 250, I don't know, 300 episodes. I don't even know what we've had now. I've never seen someone work so hard to give an answer that was true. <laughs> No, yeah, no, 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 that's, that's a compliment. Okay, that, 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 yeah. That's not a joke. That's just honoring the moment that, yeah. that you worked hard to find that answer. And I, I appreciate the effort because I think it will very much help other people yeah. when, they, when they listen, particularly fives. Mm -hmm. But I just had two thoughts in response or two senses that I wanted to respond to. 
The first is um, what I experienced as you were speaking, as you were making contact with very deep emotion, um, was uh, I felt like I was watching an example of great masculinity. Hmm. Huh. Thanks for saying that. Mm -hmm. hmm. Because I do think that feelings matter. You know, then uh, the second thing that struck me was you were talking about L'Enfant and this man holding the, mm -hmm. the, the baby, right? This masculine man holding the baby. But what was attractive to the woman was the way that the baby was looking at the man. So, you know, in psychology, of course, you know this, we call that mirroring. Mm -hmm. That when the mother or the father peers into the eyes of the newborn, that the child looks up and their existence is validated. So they have a sense of, oh, I am separate from, of course, in the beginning, I'm not separate, but eventually the child knows I am separate from you. I have a, I am, mm -hmm. I have my own personhood, my own sense of self, right? Mm. But I would say that if you look at the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the vast, unless they're biologically or genetically driven, the vast majority of illnesses in that book are as a result of somehow or another the gaze between the father and mother and the child being interrupted or broken. Hmm. Hmm. And hmm. I think part hmm. of the journey as of a father is to learn how to gaze into the eyes of their children with that great, a word that love doesn't even capture, right? That seems to be too trivial even, a word to, it's really that the, the parent isn't looking at them, they're beholding them. They're, mm -hmm. they're seeing deeply into the soul of the other, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, we oftentimes, particularly in therapy, you know, we, we, we privilege words, you know, tell your children this, you know, you know, and yes, of course, we should tell our children we love them. But sometimes it's the gaze. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's the touch. And sometimes it's the words. And uh, so there are lots of ways to communicate. And I think that uh, I hope fives don't think, oh, I've got to gush feelings in order for my children to feel I love them. I've gotten better with uh, gestures. I struggle to make eye contact. I'm doing it with you now. It's a rote mechanism. Like I do it because I was told you're supposed to make eye contact. That's what humans expect. Not for too long. Look away, then back, then look away. Like I've learned. This is a learned behavior. My son, the same thing. Like, this is what we've learned. It can become mechanistic. But I always avoided hugs and any kind of touching. Just just avoided it. And now I initiate it. Interesting. And this is, this is recent. This is in the last few years. And I still have shocking friends. They're like, whoa, 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 Brand? You all right? Like, you're initiating now. You're not running, not shirk. I used to just shirk away just reflexively. Like you, you hug Carolyn on the way out, you know, you shake Brant's hand or you say, hey, thanks for coming. But now I initiate it and I've just realized it's part of being human. It's good. Um, and it's good for my son and it's good for my daughter and it's good for my wife and my mom and my neighbors and my friends. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, first of all, this conversation could go on forever because I'm so Absolutely. curious and, and so <laughs> not just curious, but deeply moved. Mm -hmm. And I feel very honored to to be in a, a conversation with with you today for a host of reasons. But I want to ask you this. Um, can you tell me what love is? Well, I think it's when I want the best for somebody else. I want. I, w I will the best for them. And I think the antithesis, the antithesis of that is me using somebody for my own ends. So I think that's what it, I think it's the best operational definition I could come up with. Uh, Dallas Willard was really good about this. He's, he would say, people use love, obviously we use it for everything. I love chocolate cake, he would say. Do you love chocolate cake? Because you, what you actually want to do is destroy it. Like, <laughs> so... <laughs> So that obviously, and we can substitute that in for a lot of romantic things too. It's like, do you really love this person or do you actually want to use this person? It, because you, you're provided these feelings that you're basically saying that you give me these feelings, you give me these benefits. It's like a contractual consumer, you know, I, I think, I think actual love would be, I want what's best for you. So mm. what do you think? Do you have a definition yourself? 
that you would hazard hmm. that I could steal and the claim for myself? No. <laughs> it would be the title of my next book? No, I think I would say something very similar. Okay. Um, it's, you know, that love is a, a radical act of self-donation. Okay, I think that's what we see in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That there's this this radical self abandoning, mm -hmm. in the good sense of the word. I don't mean that in the contemporary psychological parlance of you know don't abandon yourself, which is true. I mean, there's levels at which you don't want to do that. Um, but I do think there's this self emptying. You know, um, Simon Tugwell has this uh, beautiful vision uh, or image. He says that the Christian life should be cruciform, hmm. mm. open armed, open like armed. the like we see on the cross, and, yeah. and meaning that. Somehow or another, that uh, we we and he calls it the radically undefended heart uh -huh. Uh -huh. to live with a radically undefended heart in the world. Man, that's a such a process. <laughs> but it's yeah. do, but you know what? There is a trajectory there where it is doable. Mm -hmm. We can get somewhere. We can get along the line there. And I had just seen this thing. I don't know if you saw this. This is like yesterday as we're recording this, but. There was this longitudinal study from Scotland. Did you see this? No. 1114 year olds were studied in 1950. And like their characteristics were written down. They did an in-depth profile on them. And they just followed up with all of them, all as many as they could. So they're what, I don't know if they're 87 or whatever, whatever they are, but there's like, there's like 200 left that assented. To yeah, do. I do. There's a documentary on this. Okay. I'm pretty certain. Yeah, I think I've seen that too. I'm not sure it's the same. Okay. It might be. But they found no relation in characteristics between the 14-year-old and the 80-year-old. Like for good or ill. It might be the good, but there's no, they, they, they just said it's, you're, you're so transformed, not just physically, like every cell in your body's changed, but it's like, our personalities, we have a trajectory that we have some control over. We can grow and learn. It's like you, you, that's what your book is. And as I was reading it, just thinking about like, no, taking that story as a child, I don't have to live that anymore. I'm not in the bathroom anymore. That's right. I don't have to shut the door theoretically or metaphysically or whatever anymore. But for, for some reason you can live that, you can live that narrative the rest of your life. I don't mm -hmm. have to. That's right. And I'm very freed by that. It's also a little scary because we are, we are, you know, shapers of our character, which C.S. Lewis was big on. Like, watch the little things when you're young because they become the big thing later. You become a caricature. But I was really heartened by that. And, and when I saw that study, I actually thought of the chapter that I'd read in your book about fives and, you know, and thinking, I don't have to be that kid. I have, I have mercy on that kid. We can feel for that kid, but, but I can, I don't have to have my arms folded up, blocking my heart the rest of my life. It can be cruciform, like you just said. Mm -hmm. And I am going to steal what you just said. It is going to, I'm not going to attribute it to you. I'm going to act like I just came up with it out of the blue. <laughs> so I hope that's all right. Feel free. Okay. Yeah. No I don't this. own it. It's just the Copyright truth. Copyright right hand. I just said it. <laughs> said it. <laughs> Well, everybody, I'm talking to Brant Hansen, the author of the new book, The Men We Need, God's Purpose for the Manly Man, the avid endorsman, and, or any man willing to show up. Brother, this was really freaking rich. Thank you. Again, an honor to talk to you. I'm so, my wife will be, she likes some of the stuff I do, you know, and well, she likes a lot of it. She's very supportive, but this will be like, I was on, I was on typology. That's she, she's excited about that. Well, it's been a it's been a delight, and I, I feel like I'm going to leave this uh, this conversation better than a better person than when I entered it. Well, I know why you're you have five friends. Why is that? Because you you're I think you're well. I guess you're making everybody better in their own number of ways, but maybe that you endeavor. To struggle with that i think fives maybe we're so obtuse or so not up to it's hard for people to understand this so it's really refreshing if somebody does hmm. and appreciates it you're you're it's like a, a moth and a light i think for a five hmm. to be understood and then you can finally relax so i think that's i'm not surprised and i know michael cusick too and i could i could totally see that yeah being friends oh strong too though Strong two on the Enneagram. Is he? Mm-hmm. Okay.
Yeah, strong too. But he has Asperger's. He does. Yeah. And there is some, we, that's a future yeah. conversation yeah. we can have yeah. about the relationship. Um, you know, I do think a lot of little kids who are fives on the Enneagram are prematurely diagnosed yes. as having Asperger's. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and I think a lot of fours uh, kids are diagnosed as being depressive too early. I think that one kids can be diagnosed as having a obsessive compulsive personality disorder or sevens with ADHD or eights with oppositional mm-hmm. personality mm-hmm. disorder or nines with, mm-hmm. you know, dependent personality do- disorder, sometimes uh, ADHD, um, sixes, you know, I suppose, uh, anxiety disorders. Of, mm-hmm. uh, I could go on and on, mm-hmm. right? right? I'm not saying that any of that might not be, might not be valid, right? I'm, I am saying that uh, and nor do I think that we shouldn't offer pharmacological interventions for children when it's appropriate. I just don't like rushing right. to conclusions yeah. when sometimes it's just their little personality growing Absolutely. up. Absolutely. You know? Totally. And then other things I, I do think, you know, for a person who has uh, uh, Asperger's that I don't entirely understand the mystery of the... Of the um, intersection between personality and and um i don't know i'm also even hesitant about labels yep y- you know what i mean like yep. they make me very tense because they're virtually sometimes i feel like okay that's just a good excuse for some kind of medical code mm-hmm. that we have to use mm-hmm. we got to call it something mm-hmm. you know so someone will pay us for talking to them right mm-hmm. but um they, they have some use i'm gonna be completely cynical about it but um, but that's a that's a conversation we can we can have down the road. But I do feel a little unqualified to kind of unpack it. So, well, I don't let qualification stop me from opining <laughs> and stuff. So I'm going to go ahead. And start. <laughs> no, I don't know either. It is a mystery. I do, I do think to me it's valuable as a shorthand way for people to understand me a little faster. Mm-hmm. Why is he always looking at the floor when he's talking, or is he not paying attention to me because he's always he's, he's not looking at me or what? You know, why did he come across, why is he so blunt sometimes? And I have to, there's just things I have to address. I got to grow up and address, but also if I can say that and people understand it, it's a relief to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all carry um, the responsibility, right? To, at some point, uh, at least attempt to live into the highest expression of who we are. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, um, for some of them, there are different things I have to do that require me to burn a lot more calories than it does somebody else of a different style mm-hmm. of being in the world, mm-hmm. you know? And so, you know, that's some of the stuff you got to expend calories for, right? So, so be it. So be it. And so be it, everybody. I want you to go out and get the men we need, God's purpose for the manly man, the avid endorsement, or any man willing to show up by my new friend, Brant Hansen, the Typology Tribe. Remember these words, may you have love. May you have joy, may you have peace, may you have healing, and may you have rest. Until next time.